This is PDB World. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali and you are watching Fault Lines. Iran is again getting closer to finalization of a deal with regards to JCPOA. There was a lot of progress made between the two sides. But then we heard something going wrong. The first thing was Israel making a lot of diplomatic protests on various forums and reminding the United States that Iran empowered with a nuclear weapon might just be a very difficult neighbor in the region to handle. And the other development was that the United States, despite being in conversation, but despite being in communication with Iran indirectly, has again uh, applied some more sanctions on Iran. Now, Iran, on the other hand, is very clear with regards to the nuclear ambition. Either they get off the hook, either they get uh, away from all the sanctions that they have been facing so far, or they continue with the program which they call a peaceful nuclear program. Our team has prepared the package. What was the package before? I bring my first guest to the program. Months of indirect talks between Iran and the U.S. President Joe Biden's administration to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear deal have hit an impasse. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi has said United States sanctions must be lifted to reach a nuclear agreement and there must be guarantees established to ensure their lasting removal. The European Union foreign policy chief, Josef Borrell, stated that negotiations to bring Iran and the U.S. back into the nuclear deal curbing Tehran's nuclear program in exchange for lifting sanctions are in stalemate. The European parties to the nuclear deal, Britain, France and Germany, last week said they have serious doubts about Iran's sincerity in wanting the pact restored. Iran called the joint declaration unconstructive and regrettable. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken stated that Iran's response to the proposal put forward by the European Union is clearly a step backwards and makes prospects for an agreement in the near term unlikely. A United Nations rapporteur published a report this week that detailed the effects of decades of embargoes on Iran and called for their removal, citing that sanctions had affected nearly every aspect of life in Iran. The IAEA said on September 7th that it is not in a position to provide assurance that Iran's nuclear program is exclusively peaceful. Tehran has long maintained that its nuclear program is focused on nuclear energy and not weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest in this studio is Mr. Nasir Moeed, who is an expert of Iranian affairs and appears frequently in my show with regards to Middle East. I welcome you to my show, my friend. Welcome, Sayyid Shabbat. And, and the first thing that we would want to discuss is to create a comprehension regarding what is happening in Iran. We see a lot of confusion, apparently. We are not clear whether uh, the international organizations want Iran to proceed or want Iran to stay stagnant under the immense debt of the sanctions that they have. What do you believe is about to happen there? Do they want Iran off the hook or do they want Iran to continue? No, uh, they uh, definitely, uh, uh, due to the Israeli pressure and American pressure, uh, they don't want uh, to uh, give Iran a lot of uh, uh, any place in, 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 in the room uh, that they can uh, create their uh, fully functional uh, nuclear program. Uh, they want to uh, eliminate Iran uh, from uh, continuing their uh, nuclear program. Uh, but in the same time, uh, the Europeans, they are in need uh, in uh, good relations with Iran due to the uh, uh, oil and gas uh, produced by Iran. Uh, they are in need of that, uh, especially uh, that Europe nowadays are into uh, energy crisis due to the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war. Nazir, you're from Iraq. You understand the discomfort that the neighbors have had or still have with Iran's, uh, with Iran's foreign policy, let's put it lightly. So do you believe that Iran with a lot of oil wealth in her hand, Iran with a lot of uh, soft power that will increase as a, result, as a result of all the money that will flow in because fuel is very expensive these days, 
Will Iran not become more difficult of a neighbor for the immediate neighborhood in the Middle East? And when I say this, I mean the countries like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, maybe UAE. Well, it's dif it's difficult currently how it would be in the future. That's true. Uh, Iran uh, needs to uh, uh, comfort its neighbors. Uh, Iran to needs to uh, have better relations uh, in the region. Uh, not only uh, not only depend on its allies uh, the, like uh, Russians, uh, like uh, other countries. Uh, they need to uh, depend on their on a good relations with their neighbors, especially. Uh, this will improve uh, their situation uh, internationally and uh, in the region. Uh, the Europeans uh, and the Americans, they have interests in the area. They, are, they have interests in, uh, uh, in the Middle East, in, uh, uh, especially in the Gulf countries where uh, uh, they have their oil companies uh, uh, operating. Uh, also, they are so much interested to uh, uh, secure uh, uh, Israel and its interests also in the region. So I have, while you were talking, I have made a list of the countries. Uh, the, the countries that for now have immense involvement of Iran and that's on record. The first I have recorded is Yemen. The other one is Lebanon, third is Iraq, and fourth is Syria or Syria. Uh, so do you see any disengagement while being in process of negotiations? Have Iran tried to disengage from any of these countries to any extent? Not yet. Uh, still, uh, Iran is in power in all these countries. Uh, they have uh, their uh, allies in uh, Iraq, in Syria, in uh, Lebanon, in Yemen. They are uh, working and uh, implementing the agendas and interests of uh, the Iranian authorities. Uh, so uh, Iran is till now is not showing any uh, any change in their uh, foreign policies uh, towards the region. Uh, that's why uh, the, and the that's the main reason why they have not been able to make a progress as yet. Well, yes, that's the main reason that Iran didn't make any progress uh, towards the, their agreement with the uh, uh, Americans and the European Union. Uh, the, uh, the, that uh, will affect uh, their long-term uh, policies, that will affect uh, their uh, internal uh, issues and problems and crises uh, for, for the short time and for the long time. Nazir, uh, taking advantage of your presence in the program, I would want to understand the political turmoil happening inside Iraq for which Iran is also blamed. Because most of the viewers of our program are not aware of the development between Iraq and Iran. So remind us what exactly was happening on the political front and why Iran is being alleged for being involved in it. Yeah, well, uh, since 2003, Iran was involved uh, in uh, destroying the uh, uh, X system uh, in Iraq, the Ba'ath Party system uh, led Saddam by Hussein Saddam Hussein. Hussein. Uh, yeah. So uh, Iran was involved in the uh, process and uh, Iran was the main ally uh, in uh, taking over the uh, political system in Iraq. Uh, they, they have uh, their uh, partners, their uh, allies uh, from uh, the uh, political parties in Iraq, uh, so-called uh, Shia parties. Uh, so the, uh, uh, that, that created a lot of uh, conflict in Iraq, especially the uh, religious and the ethnic uh, conflict. Uh, uh, also, uh, as, as, uh, as we know, uh, that Iran have uh, also disagreements, uh, have a lot of uh, issues with uh, some of the uh, Gulf countries uh, like Saudi Arabia. So uh, Iraq became an uh, open field uh, of, uh, you know, solving uh, their, their issues, fighting their issues uh, in, in this open field. And uh, how does Muqtada Sadr integrates into this picture? Because there was a lot of news coming about Muqtada Sadr and his supporters. And Iran was again to be blamed for it, at least in the international media. So I would want to understand from you. 
Well, yes, he was uh, definitely uh, supported by uh, the Saudis uh, and, the, uh, and the Americans uh, uh, to, uh, you know, limit, elim eliminate the Iranian power into Iraq because uh, in, in Iraq, uh, Iran was, uh, was in power, Iraq was, uh, Iran was uh, uh, controlling uh, mo most of majority of the Iraqi land uh, except uh, the uh, northern Kurdish region. Uh, so uh, the uh, Saudis and the Americans, uh, they wanted to uh, emulate, uh, eliminate the Iranian control uh, over this region because uh, it is their interest and it's also neighboring to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> now let's talk about Lebanon. And Lebanon is a country where uh, Israel has a lot of concerns as well uh, because of the active uh, nature of uh, Hezbollah that is active in Lebanon as well as in the front of Syria. Israel is feeling increasingly threatened and Israel being a very close ally of the United States is causing problems uh, for, for this deal to go through. So do you believe that the role of Hezbollah actually daunts threats for, for Israel or Israel's interest in the region? Yes, uh, historically Hezbollah was uh, established uh, to fight against Israel and to, uh, uh, to, to uh, yani have an agenda of, uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, fighting uh, to uh, the rights of uh, Lebanese and to the rights of Palestinians. Uh, so uh, historically Hezbollah is uh, an uh, enemy, major enemy of uh, Israel and uh, as we know uh, that uh, Hezbollah is uh, backed by Iran. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the main region, uh, th that's the main reason uh, Iran uh, is still an enemy, main enemy of uh, Israel in the region and uh, no uh, negotiations uh, international negotiations have uh, bring any uh, any uh, comfort, any uh, uh, positivity to the relations between Iran and uh, Israel. Uh, Iran and Israel are uh, always uh, having issues uh, like the uh, drones, uh, drones issue, recent issue, uh, like uh, Iran attacking some uh, Israeli uh, yani interests or Israeli uh, institutions in uh, uh, some countries. Uh, and that's also uh, in vice versa. Israel was uh, attacking some areas inside Iran, uh, some factories, uh, especially uh, factories which have uh, uh, military uh, products. Uh, Israel was also attacking these. Now, coming to Saudi Arabia, that is not only a key supporter or a key partner of the United States in the entire of Middle East, but also has a very important economic role in the region. And because of that economic role, there is an increasing diplomatic role for them as well. How comfortable will Saudi Arabia be with Iran getting through the steel and Iran getting financially empowered, Iran shelving off the nuclear program, particularly when the project Yemen is still not over? Well, of course, uh, Saudi is uh, not uh, not comfortable at all uh, uh, for uh, any uh, deal which will bring more power to uh, Iran. Uh, the Americans uh, they want uh, they want stability in the region. Uh, they want uh, balance in the region as well. Uh, one, if one country uh, will have uh, uh, a nuclear power, a nuclear program which can, uh, which which is used uh, not for uh, uh, civilian purposes, uh, then this will bring unbalance uh, in the region, uh, and this will affect the American interests and also the Saudi interests. Uh, the Saudi Arabia have uh, a lot of uh, oil fields. Uh, they are uh, a big economic p power in uh, the Middle East, and uh, this this is it's very risky to Saudi uh, if uh, if Iran uh, have uh, nuclear power 
or nuclear program uh, for uh, non-civilian uh, purposes. My last question, and it's a very specific question. Now, on the list that we have uh, pointed out, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, we didn't mention uh, Gaza in it or Palestine in it. Now, do you believe the active support of Hamas is actually a problem, given all what has happened between the two sides and, you know, the supply routes have been uh, more guarded now? Do you believe the support of Hamas is still a problem for Israel when it comes to Iran? Well, yes, uh, the two powers, uh, Israel and Iran, uh, definitely they, uh, every one of them, they want to uh, have uh, more power uh, against the other. Uh, Israel uh, is a nuclear power, uh, which didn't uh, sign any uh, international uh, agreement, uh, and uh, Iran is uh, not happy with that. That's why Iran, uh, Iran uh, supports Hezbollah, Iran supports Hamas, uh, Iran supports uh, Al-Jihad. Uh, uh, all these organizations are supported by Iran to uh, em eliminate uh, Israel and to keep it uh, busy internally. Uh, th this is the main reason. Thank you very much, Nazir, for being guest in today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break and we'll join you back with the second segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Before the break, we had the honor of having Mr. Nazir Muid, who is an expert of Middle East, uh, originally from Iraq. And he was talking about the international challenges uh, that the neighboring states believe that they have because of Iran's uh, extraordinary ambitions in the region. Now, we also need to have a point of view from Iran itself, because most of the time when we talk about Iran, the opinions are coming from the surroundings. So for that matter, we have invited two extremely reputable guests from Iran to join me in this program. Over the phone, my first guest is uh, Dr. Hamid Ghulam Zadeh. He is President and Director General of House of Diplomacy in Tehran. It's an independent research uh, think tank. And with him, I have uh, Dr. Tawheed Asadi, who is researcher at University of Tehran. He is former editor, IS. NA News Agency to join me on the show. Dr. Hamid, starting from you, welcome to the show. Dr. Hamid, what exactly is happening with regards to JCPOA? What, what's the inside from Tehran? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting development. Dr. Dr. Hamid Ghulam Zadeh, tell us what exactly is happening with regards to JCPOA in Tehran. We are actually at the closest moment a point to the uh, agreement uh, for the last almost 20 months that the negotiations have been going on. And uh, now the differences are on the minority, minor, minor points, which are not very decisive. They are important, but they are not like the, uh, preventing a deal or something like that. Uh, there are some points that can be agreed upon with minor changes, with some political decisions, such things. At that point, uh, then we can have an agreement. Uh, so it is not like that uh, there is a situation that we have tough uh, situations that cannot be agreed upon by each side, either Iranian side or the American side. Uh, so because of that, so since we are very close to a deal right now, uh, it is very important and all the sides are uh, trying to uh, raise their points. Uh, some opposition points and some also some agreements. So the pro uh, deal uh, are supporting the deal, are trying to shed light on the positive signs, on the agreements, such things. And the opponents are trying to uh, actually focus on the differences that might be between the two sides or the, the points that have been sensitive for 
Hi, but but Dr. Hamid, yeah, very important point that we have noticed, uh, at least from Pakistan, is that Iran and United States, despite being direct stakeholders, are not talking directly. Is that a right assumption? Is that a right understanding? No. Uh, for Iran, it, it is important to adhere to the JCPOA. Even all the measures that Iran has taken so far, like, for example, increasing the enrichment or increasing the stockpile and such things, have been based on the Article 26 of the JCPOA, uh, in which it says that uh, Iran is going to limit itself in return for the uh, measures that the other side takes, like, for example, removing sanctions and such things. So since it has not happened, Iran is actually increasing its activities in nuclear uh, uh, facilities and nuclear industry. So uh, with that, since Iran is following the JCPOA, there is no American member to the JCPOA. So Americans are not a member to JCPOA so that Iran would uh, discuss with them or would negotiate with them. Uh, so it is being done indirectly through the EU and the European sides. Uh, they are actually discussing the points and the, and the, the topics that uh, is, uh, are raised by Iranian side and then uh, they discuss it with the Americans. So there is no direct talks between Iran and the U.S. Because if Iran wa would like to do some uh, nuclear talks with I I the United States, it would be an approval of the membership of the United States in the JCPOA, which is not true and uh, would be a uh, actually... Against let me let me let the, me bring uh, Dr. Tohid Asadi to the conversation. Dr. Tohid, um, these are surprising moments uh, for at least the observers who are sitting outside and seeing what is happening inside Iran. Perhaps for the first time, United States and Russia are collectively agreeing with what is happening with regards to JCPOA. So JCPOA becomes a subject where United States and Russia. Both agree to what is happening with Iran. Would you agree with me on that? The matter is that uh, from a realistic vantage point, uh, the negotiations and the negotiating teams of each country have not been in Vienna for kind of charity work. And obviously what tops the list of priorities for each country is to serve their own national interest. Uh, with that said, I think uh, the Russians have a kind of common interest with Iran and also have a common rivalry with the United States due to which they seem to support the deal. And at the same time, uh, they have reservations about the energy politics and energy market and a concern that if Iran's oil finds its way to European market, then it will be more arduous for them to keep up their battle uh, and under the context of the existing situation in Ukraine. Uh, and the point regarding the United States is that uh, the Americans have faced uh, domestic partisan conflicts uh, pertaining to the revival of the deal. Uh, they are not considered anymore as an internationally accountable partner after the former president Donald Trump unilaterally withdraw from the deal. And right now they have to uh, satisfy their partners that are kind of poles apart. Israelis uh, on the one hand try to pre prevent the revival of the deal because of their a rancorous, hostile approach towards Iran. And on the other hand, the winter is coming and Europeans need to see the deal uh, obtained to make sure that their energy needs are met. All in all, uh, what has been taking place is a victory for Iran because uh, it clearly indicated that the Islamic Republic is the country that uh, regardless of all the failures, all the pressures directed against the country, uh, never gave up following up a diplomatic trajectory, regardless of the fact that the United States responded Iran's uh, full-fledged commitment to the deal uh, by hundreds of additional sanctions and unilateral 
uh, let's say, withdrawal from the deal, the country never uh, gave up the deal and it showed that how internationally accountable the Islamic Republic is. Coming back to you, Dr. Hamid Ghulamzadeh, the problem with Israel is beyond comprehension. Now, Israeli Prime Minister has given a sweeping statement. He has asked President of the United States to be extremely watchful because he believes that this deal is going to further empower Iran, something that will keep haunting Israeli dream. So what do you think is the problem with Israel? Israel uh, does Israel want Iran to go forward with the uranium enrichment for peaceful purposes or whatever? Or does Israel want Iran to shelf the nuclear ambition and to proceed forward? What exactly is Iran, Israel thinking at the moment with regards to Iran? No surprise that the, um, uh, the Israelis are against the deal and uh, since the deal would actually uh, uh, pave the ground for the Iranians to act and uh, relate with the other world, uh, with the rest of the world as a normal country and the limits would be lifted for, for the Iranians, uh, it is something that again is against the uh, interests of the Zionist regime. So they would like to limit Iran to the utmost possible situation and it is not like that they would be act logically or with a uh, politically right position on the negotiations. They would, they would like to put only sanctions, only pressures on Iran and to give no benefits at all to Iran. So th with that policy, it is clear that the Israelis would be against that. And the, the, the limits, the, the points that they are making is to trying to put pressure on the Americans, not to actually uh, give up any benefits to Iran and to uh, ask for more uh, more points actually but uh, that's the point the uh, it is more political and anyway they understand that it would be for better for the world to make sure that uh, Iran is limiting its nuclear uh, power or nuclear facilities aren't uh, working in a limited way uh, uh, so that's why they are against any sort of the deal uh, to the maximum point that they could be doing that. There is another point. The Israelis uh, believe that they can stop Iran and its nuclear uh, um, actions and nuclear power by damaging that and by sabotaging that and by uh, committing terrorist attacks and such things. They would uh, believe that they can control Iranian power with that. Uh, so because of that, they are warning the Americans to uh, not to do the deal uh, very soon and, and they, they would try to uh, give them some, uh, let's say, some warnings that you can uh, wait, we would uh, make some damage to Iranian uh, nuclear facilities and you need to give up less actually to, uh, in, to in return for what Iran is going Do to do. Dr. So Hamid, that, but they are against, uh, Dr. Hamid I'm sorry for, for sorry for interrupting here, but there is an other problem attached with it. Uh, given the petroleum prices that we have in the world today, the shortage of uh, supply by all the GCC countries together, and, uh, and the significance of fuel in the international economy, it has been estimated that if Iran gets off the hook, if Iran gets off the sanctions, it will get at least $100 billion right away with, with the deal. And that might be a very difficult situation for countries like Saudi Arabia, who enjoy a wonderful relationship with the United States, but do not have a great relationship with Iran. What do you think of it? Uh, it could be. However, uh, realistically speaking, uh, the uh, Saudis or the Zionists know that Iran is not bound to uh, the, 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 let's say, dollars or petrol dollars and such things. And the, the power that Iran has uh, generated uh, for the, the last four decades is not based on money. It is based on the soft power that Iran has, uh, has actually shaped and has uh, uh, gained uh, for the last uh, for decades, so it is. Uh, it, it can be a concern because it can uh, make it uh, facilitate what Iran can do. But the power of Iran, which is the main concern for the Zionists and for the Saudis, is not something can be that can be uh, actually 
limited to the monies and dollars and such things. Uh, can be a concern, but not a major concern. And they would find some ways to, again, sabotage that. So uh, the, I won't be surprised if the, the deal is signed and after that, the Zionists and the Saudis do their best and be, be, get more active to sabotage the deal and prevent uh, actions from the American side, as we had seen in, the, in 2015, uh, in which the, uh, the Obama administration did not actually take enough measures to lift all the sanctions. Even he himself was not uh, uh, actually adhering to all the promises and the co commitments that he had made uh, within the deal. So there might be some uh, uh, efforts from the um, uh, Saudi and uh, Zionist sides to uh, stop the or um, well, let the deal after the uh, deal is reached. Dr. Hamid, since uh, Dr. Dohid has to uh, go somewhere, uh, let me ask him the last question of this program. Uh, Dr. Dohid Asadi, uh, we understand that Iran has faced a lot of problems on the economic front with all these sanctions that have haunting effect on the Iranian economy. But do you believe or would you agree with us if we say uh, that primarily economics is the reason behind the softness that we can see in Iran's approach toward JCPOA? Or is it something beyond the economics of it? If, if we talk, if we take a critic view of uh, Iran's approach to the JCPOA. When we started years earlier, uh, the nuclear talks were intended to recognize and reserve the right for Iranians to have a purely peaceful nuclear program. Iran accepted to put their uh, program under a strict control of IAEA and additional monitoring protocols as well. However, and on the basis of lies and false allegations, the United States put the most, as they say, crippling and cruel sanctions that uh, targeted Iran, some of them actually targeting ordinary citizens. Uh, well, as far as the ongoing talks are concerned, uh, with no small spat of hesitation, uh, lifting the sanctions is a key objective for the Iranian negotiators. And at the same time, we know that there is a clear air of mistrust uh, that exists due to a past experience and failure of the West to fulfill their commitments in accordance to the deal. So I think juxtaposed to the past, Iran is more conservative and desires to uh, make sure that any potential deal obtained in Vienna will be translated into action and practice. And also there is a further concern for the Iranian side which relates to the safe force probe and the extent to which IAEA could fairly address Iranian nuclear activities in an unpoliticized manner. So these are some uh, key objectives and big reasons for Iran uh, to follow the trajectory of diplomacy and uh, attempt to obtain Point the taken. Deal. Point taken, Dr. Tohid Asadi, and thank you very much for being guest in the program. As you had said, you uh, couldn't join us beyond this point, so thank you very much. We'll continue the conversation with Dr. Hamid Walamzadeh. Uh, Dr. Hamid, uh, with regards to the conversations or negotiations that are taking place between the two sides, Iran has made a major compromise. And that is, Iran has uh, agreed uh, not to insist any further uh, the request of removal of Iranian Islamic uh, gods from the list of the banned outfits. Now, is it another uh, step to, by Iran to make the terms softer for the members of JCPOA? Is, is, can, can we believe that it's an act of softness on part of Iran? The idea of uh, lifting the sanctions on the IRGC and removing the FTO tag from the IRGC, IRGC was primarily raised and put on the table by the American side. It was not a request from the Iranian side. It was actually originally offered by them uh, to ask for something in return on that, especially on the regional issues. Uh, what 
what's important for Iran in that regard uh, is that, uh, first of all, IRGC have been sanctioned and have been point of uh, uh, discussion always, and it is not nothing new, and it is not like that the IRGC is uh, limited because of the sanctions. It, it, it are actually, uh, they are used to uh, the sanctions and working uh, with the sanctions. Uh, the point is that what was point of concern for Iran was the actually the, uh, the, the, the impact that it could be could have on the others, like for example, uh, if uh, someone, a, a normal a civil citizen, a citizen, would work with an organization or a company which had some relations in, in any terms with the IRGC or uh, its subdivisions uh, or its affiliates, it could be uh, uh, subject to sanctions against. So the sanction would, the tag and the sanction would be actually contingent to anyone who had uh, worked with the IRGC in any levels, with any uh, um, um, intermediaries. So if, uh, for example, uh, if a bank is connected to the IRGC, for example, for construction projects, uh, then all the, uh, the, the clients who have accounts on that bank could be a target to the sanctions because of this connection. Uh, either it has any direct or indirect relations to the IRGC or the activities which are under the sanctions from the American side. So that was actually the point uh, uh, for around that, in which, uh, based on the reports, it has been resolved. So it's actually the Americans who have, have accepted to stop this uh, contingency policy, and uh, then uh, the FTO uh, tag on the IRGC would be uh, working only for the IRGC directly and not with the others who would work that either the companies, Iranian, uh, um, non-Iranians. Of course, the limit would be still on the American companies. But Dr. Hamid, let me ask you a very straightforward question. This is being discussed in the international media and opinions are coming from outside Iran. So let me take uh, your point of view on that. Tell me if Iran has clearly given up on the nuclear ambition that it possessed? You know, for Iran, uh, the approach toward the nuclear uh, power is only a pragmatical point, a practical point. Iran needs uh, nuclear facilities for generating power and electricity. Iran needs it for medical uh, facilities, uh, which is mainly in Tehran. And the, 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 the use is only in these levels. Uh, and it has always wanted this. Uh, uh, Previously, after the, the first round of talks nearly 20 years ago, uh, when the Iranians, uh, when, they, when the Western countries uh, refused to provide Iran with 20% uh, 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 let's say uranium for the Tehran medical facility, Iran stepped forward to pro produce that. So before that, Iran was not seeking a 20% enrichment. It was actually the Europeans who forced Iran to do that. So. Uh, Iran is looking at the nuclear uh, power, nuclear industry, as something practical which can help Iran to do its job to serve its citizens. Uh, it, it has never been following a nuclear weapon, for, uh, for, uh, weapon degree enrichment or such things at all. So it's not, Iran is not giving up any ambition, any particular ambitions. Uh, what it is doing is to actually uh, give up the extra things that it could have uh, given up earlier, and it has not been falling at all. It was not pursuing uh, basically. It is based on the force that the Westerners put on Iran to follow that. Uh, so Iran is uh, still uh, following its uh, enrichment to the level necessary for the Boucher uh, uh, electricity power plants and it, uh, still uh, is going to keep uh, the level of enrichment or the stockpile that could be necessary for the Boucher or Tehran or other places that Iran is working, like for example the medical uh, usage and such things. So they are still in place and uh, Iran is giving up on the all the rest of the things that have never been necessary for this peaceful use of nuclear uh, power. Okay, Dr. Hamid, I, I agree with what you said, but then th this gives birth to another question. And the question is that if United States, in your worthy opinion, 
have decided to go for a richer Iran versus having a nuclearly equipped Iran. We can discuss that it was actually, there was no other choice for the Americans to accept a deal, uh, either in this way or the other way. Uh, the point is that, uh, first of all, uh, the maximum pressure campaign uh, totally failed. The sanctions regimes uh, totally failed. And Iran was uh, stepping forward and forward uh, to have both the uh, nuclear power in a very high level, like, for example, 60% enrichment, which is very close to higher levels of enrichment, and was uh, getting used to living with the sanctions and actually nullifying the sanctions by, by finding other ways to uh, work with the rest of the world, especially with the, uh, let's say, sanctioned countries uh, club, we can say, call it. Uh, so Iran was uh, is already selling from like maybe around uh, one million uh, barrels a day uh, with the unofficial reports, uh, which is very enough for the uh, routines of the Iranian uh, economy. Uh, it was actually on the other side. Uh, President Biden came to uh, the Middle East to try to uh, improve the situation of the uh, energy market in the world after the. Ukraine uh, crisis, and he failed. He just gave some benefits to uh, Ben Salman uh, after this uh, the Khashoggi issue, and there was no no uh, achievements regarding the energy market. Uh, so he needs actually something to do something to say that I can just change the situation of the world. I can be a leader for the world. Uh, just uh, he needs to prove that he has some differences with with uh, President Trump, uh, which I doubt, of course. But anyway, uh, to show that President Biden needs to reach an agreement. Uh, almost two years uh, has passed uh, since the Biden, Biden administration. And despite his opposition to, uh, lifting the, uh, to leaving the, uh, the deal by President Trump, he has done not, almost nothing to return to the deal. So, and the, 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 the sanctions are not lifted. The, uh, the demands that are excessively uh, recurring in the negotiations have been recurring in the last 20 months uh, are something to uh, actually stop uh, against the stand against the, the uh, reaching a deal. And it's not something that uh, we can say that they are doing their best to do that, to reach that. So he now at this point, which has we in which he doesn't have any foreign policy achievements in which he doesn't have any particular economic achievement domestically or internationally, he needs something to say that I am successful and I am doing something, I am achieving something uh, in the international arena. And because of that, it is actually the United States who needs the deal more than anyone else. And uh, so because of that, uh, he had uh, actually no other choice. The only choice that he has is on the on minor points, as I said, either to give up on some issues or to accept some issues or to uh, demand for some issues. And that is the point that they uh, are working on. Doc Dr. Hamid, if I agree with whatever you have just said and if the things go the way you anticipate and if all of the diplomatic efforts that are being so persuasively made by Iran, uh, Iran is somehow uh, able to ripe the fruits of it. Tell me what will be the implications for Pakistan? Because we are a country that uh, are in the neighborhood of Iran and we heavily struggle to pay our import bill based on the oil that we uh, import from the rest of the world, while Iran in the immediate neighborhood has so much of resources that we cannot tap given all the sanctions that Iran is facing. I actually I strongly believe that the uh, transactions and the, the trade between Iran and Pakistan needs to be much more than what is currently right now. And uh, it should not be uh, actually limited because of the sanctions. They are two neighboring countries and they don't need the others to decide for their relations. Uh, so it could be much higher than what we are currently witnessing between the two countries. But anyway, with the, with the deal uh, on the ground and with the sanctions lifted, that would be a very good opportunity uh, for Pakistan because Iran and this, the current administration in Iran, in Iran is emphasizing on relations with the neighbors. 
for Iran, the neighboring countries are the most important ones. And the policy is working on them first of all. So the, the first target and the first actually uh, partner for Iran in foreign policy are the neighboring countries and Pakistan is no exception to that. Uh, and there are a lot of grounds that they can work with each other. So, uh, as I said, I do believe that this can be done even without sanctions lifted. Uh, it can be done more than right now. Uh, but anyway, with sanctions lifted, the two sides need to put more focus on that and seriously work on increasing this, uh, uh, actually, the trade between the two themselves and to, uh, especially like, for example, especially in uh, energy market, they they need to work seriously. Pakistan can enjoy from the uh, Iranian oil, and uh, the uh, import and export of other uh, goods can be increased, of course, between the two countries. And there are a lot of things that they can do to each other with each other. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamid Ghulam Zadeh, for being guest in our program today. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Dr. Hamid Ghulam Zadeh. So in today's program, we had a contrast perspective coming from an expert who is originally from Iraq and coming from two different experts inside Iran, inside Tehran, who understand Iran's perspective. We just wish and hope that things go through well from this point onward. A couple of things that I would want to say in that of the program is that Iran's problem has to be sorted out. The world cannot keep looking at the other side of the picture while well, the countries like Syria, like Iraq, like Iran, like Libya, and let's not forget about Russia, are standing off the grid towards the supply of international oil and energy market. It's almost impossible to sort out the problems faced by the energy market in the world today. And if these problems are not sorted off, the world will not become a peaceful place in a short term as the economic miseries and worries will exacerbate over a period of time. We'll join you next week with that other program. And until then, allow us. And you